Endosymbiotic hypothesis, as told by Group 10. There are multiple theories as to how eukaryotic cells developed. The most widely accepted theory is the endosymbiosis hypothesis. First, let's acknowledge some oppositions as to why some people refute this hypothesis. One, there was no viable mechanism for the transfer of genes from the mitochondria to the nucleus. Two, the origin of eukaryotes may have been a product of gene duplication. And lastly, mitochondria would have had to have genetic code that worked with the host cell in order to not cause mayhem. That's as far as we're going to explain. The evidence supporting endosymbiosis is robust. Lynn Margulis was the first person to argue for endosymbiosis in her paper that you got right down there. Let's set the stage two billion years ago when the first endosymbiosis occurred. The theory proposes that an early prokaryotic cell engulfed the bacteria, but the bacteria was not digested. The cells actually formed a symbiotic relationship. No way! Even more surprisingly, this bacteria became what we know now as the mitochondria. Now these two seemingly independent organisms became dependent on one another. So how do we know that the bacteria and the mitochondria are related? Within this new organelle, there is circular DNA much like the ones found in modern-day bacteria. Scientists also use DNA sequencing to provide evidence of these similarities. When comparing mitochondrial DNA to nucleus DNA and endosymbiotic hypothesized ancestor DNA, it was revealed that the most similar of these three were the mitochondrial DNA and the endosymbiotic hypothesized ancestor DNA. Fun fact, did you know that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts divide independently of the host cell, meaning that if the cell lacks a mitochondria or chloroplast, they will never develop within the host cell? Further evidence can be drawn from the different levels of endosymbiosis. Every time a cell is enveloped by another cell, they develop another phospholipid bilayer. There is a double phospholipid layer in both mitochondria and chloroplasts, suggesting they underwent primary endosymbiosis. The euglena. Euglena's chloroplasts have three phospholipid membranes from secondary endosymbiosis. Scientists use darkness and chemicals to destroy plastids without harming the euglena. Dead plastids cannot revive themselves or generate chemical energy, so the euglena stops metabolizing and they die. Oh, but wait! How is the original bacteria not digested? Lochiarchaeota and archaea has an array of signature eukaryotic genes thought to be critical for enabling endosymbiosis. These genes are involved in membrane remodeling and vesicular trafficking. This allows the Lochiarchaeota to engulf a mitochondrial-like cell and not digest it, but integrate it. Another theory of endosymbiosis. James Lake proposed that gram-negative bacteria's two-membrane wall is likely a result of endosymbiosis. It is hypothesized that the two thin layers on gram-negative bacteria originated from the fusion of archaea and gram-positive bacteria. That would give us the peptidoglycan cell wall between the two membranes. In conclusion, endosymbiosis explains the evolution of eukaryotic cells through the engulfment of another prokaryotic cell. The engulfed cells serve as organelles in the cell, such as mitochondria or chloroplasts. These organelles have their own circular DNA and divide on their own. Special genes allow for the engulfed DNA not to be digested, and endosymbiosis can also be used to explain the gram-negative bacteria's double membrane cell. Created using Powtoon.